Um, <laughs> okay. There you go. Uh, I, I, I want to wish everybody a healthy, happy, and a safe new year. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you back to this year's McLean Center annual lecture series, um, which as you know, is entitled Ethics in the COVID-19 Pandemic, Medical, Social, and Political Issues. I'm very excited about the 11 lectures during this winter quarter, the first of which will be today by Dan Solmezi, um, with, with this special emphasis this quarter on um, healthcare disparities and on the allocation of the COVID-19 vaccine. For example, next week, uh, Dr. Monica Peake will be speaking on the topic of health disparities and the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, uh, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Dan Solmezi as our speaker. As many of you recall, uh, Dan worked for seven years here at the University of Chicago where he was the Kilbright Clinton Professor of Medicine and Ethics in the Department of Medicine and in the Divinity School, and was also the Associate Director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and, and the Director of the University's Program on Medicine and Religion. Currently, uh, Dan Salmezi is the Andre Helliger's Professor of Biomedical Ethics in the Department of Medicine and Philosophy at Georgetown University, where he is also the acting director of the Kennedy Institute of Ethics and a faculty member of the Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics. Dan received his AB and MD degrees from Cornell, trained in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins, and holds a PhD in philosophy from Georgetown. He served on numerous governmental advisory committees, including the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues between 2010 and 2017. His research interests encompass both theoretical and empirical investigations of the ethics of end-of-life decision-making, informed consent for research, and spirituality in medicine. He's the author or editor of seven books, which include his original book in 1997, entitled The Healer's Calling, and his 2001 first edition and 2010 second edition of a book entitled Methods in Medical Ethics. Dan's most recent book is entitled Physician Assisted Suicide and euthanasia before, during, and after the Holocaust. Dan also has served for many years as editor-in-chief of the journal, Theoretical Medicine and Bioethics. Today, Dan will speak to us on the following topic. Age, life years, and fair innings, the ethics of chronometric rationing in the COVID-19 pandemic. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our great colleague and, and friend, Dr. Dan Salmezi. Dan, welcome. <laughs> thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for that uh, very gracious uh, in introduction. I wish I could be there with, uh, with all of you in reality. Um, we have to accept um, Zoom for now, and I guess we're all grateful that we've been able to continue um, our um, academic lives through the uh, through the courtesy of this kind of uh, kind of technology. Now imagine what it would have been like to have gone through COVID um, with uh, without this kind of distance learning. I mean, I taught uh, my whole seminar this uh, past fall semester online, um, and that's um, something I, I um, I'm grateful I was able to do, although I still missed the interaction with uh, my students and missed uh, the interaction with all of you. Let me try to share screen here. Um, let's see if I can uh, um, get that. Uh, is that sharing? Can somebody tell me? No. No. Um, I've put this up. There we go. Good. Share. 
Good. And we go to the slideshow. Good. All right. Yes. Good. So we've got it all now. Um, so what um, I thought I would talk to you about is something that um, has um, been of interest and concern to me um, in the setting of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, uh, which is the use of um, age uh, and life years and related topics um, in uh, talk of rationing, uh, particularly intensive care resources uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, so the, uh, the question is, um, how should we um, allocate um, scarce um, medical resources? Um, and um, there have been some um, answers you've probably um, seen um, recently in the last few months in the literature, one by uh, Zeke Emanuel and his uh, colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, in which they say that um, saving more year, uh, saving more lives and more years of life is a consensus um, value um, in how we ought to approach the use of scarce resources like ventilators and intensive care units um, in the setting of potentially an overwhelming surge of patients with, uh, with COVID-19. Um, likewise, um, in uh, uh, JAMA, um, Doug White and Bernie Lowe um, uh, said that younger individuals should receive priority, um, not because of any claims of social worth or utility, but because they uh, uh, are the worst off in the sense that they have not uh, had the um, opportunities to live through life's stages. Um, and so the idea has been put out there um, in prominent uh, venues that we should ration ventilators, intensive care units um, by a principle of maximizing not the number of lives saved necessarily, uh, but the, uh, the lives, to total years of life that we would, uh, we would save. So most of this talk are to um, identify where the years uh, came from, uh, to demonstrate state policies, um, to introduce four challenges that would counter the claim um, that saving more years of life is a consensus value, uh, and then present to you an alternative proposal that I think is a better way to think about justly um, allocating um, resources um, in the event of an overwhelming surge of patients with um, uh, COVID-19. So where did this concept of life years come from um, in the first place? Um, I did a lot of digging um, on this. Um, and um, actually, it goes back um, to the 40s um, in epidemiologic literature. Um, and um, the concept then was the number of years of potential life that were lost due to the burden of disease in society. Um, in 47 and 48, I'm talking particularly about um, uh, tuberculosis, um, um, but also other causes of death. So it was initially a way of measuring the sort of burden that disease placed upon um, society and the sort of cost of total potential years of life that might be lost due to those diseases. Um, then came um, thinking about um, dialysis um, and um, then there was a twist. Um, people began to talk in terms of dialysis of the years of life that would be saved by the introduction of this. So it goes from a negative concept of what disease does um, to society to a positive concept of what medicine can do for persons and for society. Um, and dialysis is uh, justification, one of the justifications for it would be how many years of life would be saved, even though it was an expensive uh, technology. It gets into the medical literature um, slightly, um, uh, medical ethics literature slightly after that. Um, um, uh, Jonathan Glover in his book, Causing Death and Saving Lives, and talks about it, talks around it a little bit. Um, John Harris in uh, a book called The Value of Life, um, and I'll come back to this quote later in the talk, 
um, I wrote in chapter five of that book, it's always a misfortune to die, but it is both a misfortune and a tragedy for life to end prematurely. Um, reflecting the kind of view that um, it is better in fact um, to save um, young lives and have um, young people live longer lives. And if we're going to have scarce resources um, for healthcare, um, the idea that's being depicted here um, is that the best way to ration them would be in a way uh, that um, minimizes the tragedy um, by um, uh, giving resources preferentially uh, to persons who are younger so that more life years could be saved. Again, I'll come back to that because um, that quote um, is used a lot um, and um, I'm not sure um, is being always interpreted correctly. Um, the concept of life years sort of was in the background of a lot of medical um, ethics decision-making, talking a little bit uh, about the use of scarce resources, but largely dormant um, for a couple of decades um, until the uh, questions arose about pandemic flu and SARS um, and the need to have emergency response plans for society. Um, and then it came back um, with uh, a vengeance, if you will, into the literature um, Zeke Emanuel and Ellen Wertheimer, who should get influenza vaccine when not all can in science in 2006, and then uh, uh, Doug White and his colleagues in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2009, who should receive life support during a public health emergency. Um, in that article, White et al. quote um, from, uh, uh, from John Harris and say that um, what we should really be doing um, in the setting of an emergency like this um, is responding in a way that maximizes the total number of life years that we save rather than um, foolishly, if you will, um, uh, or naively, simply um, uh, trying to save the most lives possible. A, a little bit um, after this, um, there was a push for further planning for this to be done um, at um, state levels, some of which actually um, as you may well know, has come to um, be prominent in the COVID-19 pandemic. But there was a push to develop what are called crisis standards of care um, from the uh, National Academies. Um, uh, one of their reports um, talked about uh, this idea of um, providing a framework for catastrophic disaster responses, um, how a society, how a medical system um, should respond. And crisis standards of care um, um, promote the idea that in a medical crisis, um, let's say um, an earthquake or um, let's say um, a pandemic flu, um, how um, we should respond will change the standard of care because of the scarcity of resources and the overwhelming need. Um, and they give in these kinds of reports um, guidance on mobilizing resources, how to do this, how to differentiate, um, how to conduct triage. These kinds of, of, uh, of standards um, give le legal protection to practitioners who follow them. Uh, the worry from lots of physicians was that, well, if we're rationing and we're not doing what we would do when uh, all the care resources are there, how are we going to be protected from um, malpractice suits if we don't give somebody something that they ordinarily would get? And so that was one of the ideas behind crisis standards of care to give this sort of legal protection to practitioners. Um, they typically um, will require a, uh, an official state level adoption. This is not just something that's done by a medical society, but a formal crisis standards of care plan it is an official legally um, recognized plan for response by the medical system um, in the event of uh, a catastrophe. Um, and typically they require some formal activation order, either by the governor or by the state health department director. Um, I should note that there um, have been um, um, some objections to these, particularly from, uh, from George Annis, who is a legal 
um, scholar suggested that the standard of care actually never changes. We're always trying to do the best we can for patients, and, the, and that's the concept behind a standard of care. And saying that it changes um, is actually, from his point of view, legally uh, problematic. Um, of course, we would do the best we would do um, um, within the setting of a catastrophe. That doesn't necessarily mean that the standard of care has, in a legal sense, changed um, to be less than what the best physicians would, uh, would do. Um, and then secondly, he's uh, argued that the sort of blanket immunity that these things um, uh, give um, leaves the public too little um, in the way of legal protection. Um, I'm not going to talk more about that, but you should know that they are of themselves um, somewhat uh, controversial. Um, but as you know, um, there were policies that were hastily updated or frantically written in the face of the uh, um, surge in patients in the um, spring in COVID-19 cases. Um, and one of the things that um, I know um, uh, some of uh, you have done um, uh, and, um, and my team has done a little bit too has been to study um, the way these uh, pandemic response plans have been um, uh, updated in the face of COVID-19. Um, but we did it um, specifically looking at the use of age-based rationing either in formal state-based crisis standards of care uh, or in uh, other state-endorsed pandemic preparedness plans. So what we concentrated on are the legally approved state-level uh, documents, and we studied um, specifically age-based rationing, not everything about these uh, uh, various plans, but just the um, use of age-based rationing. Um, and here's um, some of what uh, uh, what we found um, um, in looking at these uh, at these plans um, that many of them do use age or longer term um, prognosis. By longer term, we mean um, something other than short term. Um, short term we defined as anybody who said survival to hospital discharge or survival up to one year is going to be their rationing procedure. We didn't think that was basing it on age so much as the patient's um, ability to benefit from, uh, from the treatment. Uh, but medium term was um, anybody who said, well, we'll uh, screen out people who are expected to only live one to five years. Life years are those plans that specifically said, um, we're going to try to calculate the number of life years the person is expected to live, and that's the way we're going to ration. Um, or something that's called fair innings. I'll get into that in a, uh, in a moment. Um, or um, under E for other, um, and you'll see your own state um, is, uh, is in that, of um, places that did not have an official um, uh, um, age-based uh, rationing uh, plan, but gave um, sort of more general guidance about how to, uh, how to do that. And then the gray of places that had no official um, state planning uh, whatsoever. Um, so um, here's as best you can later correct me if, uh, um, if our reading of uh, Illinois was incorrect, uh, but there was a pandemic flu plan in 2006 that only covers operational plans uh, for meeting a surge without explicit planning for rationing. There was an emergency operations plan in 2018 urging priority to those who can most benefit and to healthcare workers without any mention of age within that. And then there were COVID guidelines um, fairly late in the process in May, uh, suggesting uh, who should do uh, triage and planning. They urged using ethical principles that were based on a working group that was working on official crisis standards of care plans for Illinois. Um, and the, uh, the principles they mentioned in their white paper, um, but didn't mention any specific criteria um, for um, uh, how to do that uh, rationing um, other than uh, basic principles such as um, respect for dignity and justice and, and questions like that. I can tell you another a very significant um, uh, finding we had, if you read all of these things and the way in which they are operationalizing their concept of life years, many of them will use life years in the text but here's the way they will cash it out. For some of them, life years means one to five year survival. For some, it meant greater than 10 year survival. 
For some, it was a more formal um, uh, incorporation of age. Um, and for some, it was just that they would prioritize children um, over adults, um, all of which they claimed was um, um, somehow incorporating the concept of life years. And this is very uh, confusing, not just in uh, these plans, um, um, and, but also uh, actually in the literature about this. Um, life years, if you think about it formally, uh, means that you should um, ration according to a principle of maximizing the net expected life years to be saved um, in that procedure. Um, but how do you operationalize that? Well, maybe you could do it by just age. Are you going to adjust for comorbidities? How are you going to do that? Nobody actually says. Um, another variation on this um, made um, uh, especially prominent by um, Doug White at the University of Pittsburgh, which was then incorporated um, into the Pennsylvania guidelines um, and then copied by several others, um, was a term they called life cycles, which was to assign weighted priority points to different kinds of age groups. Now, again, they just took arbitrarily um, certain kinds of age groups, but there was no real principle behind how one does that and says that that's a way of cashing out um, uh, life years. Um, should it be by stages of life in a sort of um, developmental sense of infant versus toddler, tween, uh, teen, et cetera? Um, should it be by deciles of age? Should it be by quartiles of age? Um, uh, again, no rationale given for this and some variations in different states. And then there's the concept of fair innings. Um, for those of you who um, are not cricket players, certainly not me, I guess the closest it comes to our American um, uh, game of baseball would be um, that um, after you've played seven innings, um, you can uh, call the game on account of rain, right? <laughs> um, so the fair innings is the idea um, coming out of cricket um, that um, uh, as an analogy, that there should be a specific age cutoff after some, somebody has enjoyed um, their fair share of life. Um, um, and this view um, became fairly popular. Um, Jonathan Glover, one of the ones who uh, talked about it um, uh, as um, a way of rationing. But again, what are your fair innings? Um, nobody gives really good justifications for that. Is it 65 years old, 75 or 90? Um, what about those people who prioritize infants as a tiebreaker in their um, uh, protocols? Um, is that in some ways a variation on fair innings, just cutting it off really short? Um, um, I'm not, uh, not quite sure. Um, but again, it's a complicated process of saying uh, when somebody has had their uh, fair innings and we should give somebody else a chance. Now with that, uh, I wanna to turn to what are the arguments that have been given for rationing um, ventilators in intensive care by any of these age-related criteria in the setting of a pandemic like COVID-19. The first argument that's been given um, is that there is public support for this. Um, one reads that in the literature, one reads that um, in some of these protocols, but you know, you've got to be a careful reader of the literature. Um, uh, and um, I'm one of those people who actually looks at people's references and tries to see what they actually say. And you know, not surprisingly, a lot of people cite things that don't actually support um, the premises that they are uh, saying is supported by the citation. So for instance, um, uh, Doug White was saying, well, you know, um, based that there's public support for rationing um, ventilators by age. And the citation they give is a 1998 um, study on allocating uh, liver donor grafts um, in a survey that has nothing to do with um, pandemics um, and is actually fairly limited in the demogra demographic representation of people who were in that survey to begin with, mostly um, younger, healthier, um, intelligent, um, uh, uh, well-educated um, uh, people. Um, very f um, uh, No mention of whether anybody was actually disabled, um, for instance. Likewise, Maryland said they went through a very thorough process. They published this in several places, put it into their um, guidelines. 
But again, they had a limited demographic representation, mostly younger, well-educated, um, uh, middle-class to upper-middle-class people. They did it by focus groups with potentially leading questions. Like they gave them the six principles they were supposed to use in guiding their decision-making. Um, and in some instances actually even um, said that the, uh, uh, for instance, in reallocating ventilators, one of the things they said they, um, uh, in their report that they supported, um, they actually said that the uh, people in the focus groups were very uneasy about this. Nonetheless, they said that their report was represented by um, the uh, uh, empirical process of going through these focus groups. So I'm not sure that we have a huge amount of well-founded information that suggests that there's high public support um, for um, this kind of age-based rationing of ventilators. Another argument that's given is we have the precedent of organ transplantation protocols, which are done by uh, age. Well, again, um, we've got to be careful about this. Um, um, the, um, one of the reasons given is lung allocation um, scores, um, um, and Doug White has, um, has given this, but that's not rationing by age necessarily. Um, uh, what they did was to, uh, I'm sorry about the uh, mix up in order there. What they did in lung allocation scores um, was to decide that they would ration on the basis of the life expectancy without the transplant, which was the patient's need, versus the overall uh, um, effectiveness of the operation measured by one year survival probability. The fact that they're measuring whether somebody survives for a year or not and measuring that about how long they would live without the transplant is hardly justification for um, saying that there is a precedent for um, rationing organs by age. Um, the first one, I'm sorry, that came up Second is that there is this view that early on people were rationing uh, organs for transplant on the basis of age cutoffs, but that wasn't on the basis of maximizing the life years they expected the person to live as a social value. It was on the basis of at least what was thought to be the ability of the person to survive the procedure, both the surgery and the immuno immunosuppression, not a way of giving priority to younger people per se as a social value. And in fact, um, um, for almost all organs, age cutoffs um, are really um, a thing of the past. Um, it was only very early on um, that people um, talked in those terms. And then the other precedent that's given, and Laney certainly knows, knows this very well, um, the um, organ um, uh, procurement and transplant networks um, uh, addressing how to allocate um, uh, kidneys explicitly rejected life years for kidney allocation, which was really being forcefully put at the time. And instead they adopted something which makes reasonable sense to me to match the expected life of the organ, the expected life of the patient um, as a way of um, maximizing the value of the, uh, of the organ without um, um, rationing according to the expected life years the person um, would live. So again, that's not um, um, rationing by uh, life years. What are the philosophical defenses that have been given for rationing by uh, life years? Now, well, you know, if you uh, look at them, you can read, for instance, in Frances Cam, um, she says, um, give to those who have not helped, will have had less of uh, the good, um, that is longer life, uh, that our resource can provide before giving um, it to those uh, who had um, even more of it, even if they're not helped. Um, but one of the problems you get into in these sorts of philosophical discussions about rationing by life years um, is a confusion, I think, on the part of the philosophers who are not physicians who are thinking this about this. They're acting as if what we're rationing is life. We're not rationing life. We're rationing the resources that we give to people who are alive. Um, and that's different. They act as if, um, for instance, life is a pie that we sort of divide, right? Um, where we're gonna make sure that everybody gets an equal slice of the pie. That's the just and fair thing to do. Um, 
but it's actually not unfair um, that um, somebody lives longer than, uh, than another person. It's not unfair to others. It's fortunate that they do, but it's not unfair. It's not as if this is some um, limited fungible um, commodity that we're dividing among people. Life is not uh, like that. Um, there's no obligation in justice, for instance, to be sure that everyone gets an equal share of life. Um, so we're not rationing life uh, here. We're rationing um, resources to people who are alive. Um, and I think there's a confusion um, that we're actually somehow um, rationing life when we're um, thinking about this. Um, Dan Brock um, um, gives a similar kind of argument. He says, Fairness would require allocating resources to persons um, 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 so they could um, reach a normal lifespan. But again, are we obligated to give people more or less equal sums of life? I mean, is that what he's really trying to say there? Um, how do we make these kinds of judgments? How sure can we be, um, particularly in giving um, resources, that somebody's not going to be hit by a truck the next next day? We're not. That's not what we're. We're not rationing life. We're rationing ventilators, we're rationing access to the intensive care unit. Um, how do we determine what a normal lifespan is? Um, do we do that by polling? Do we do that by the intuitions of Dan Brock and Francis Cam? Um, Dan Brock doesn't give us any defense for this beyond his intuition that this is the fair way to do it. Um, you might think of, um, uh, um, uh, and Dan Brock specifically then turns to Norman Daniels um, and talks about a prudential life um, uh, span account. But what Daniels is doing is he's aiming to distribute resources um, over a single lifespan. Um, so it's better than um, thinking about um, rationing life. So I think Daniels has that on his side. He's clearer than others that we're thinking about resource that what we're um, rationing is not life, but we're rationing the resources to give to people over the single span of their life. And he tries to give this Rawlsian account of um, how many, how should we divide resources um, over the account of an, uh, of an entire lifespan where we're in the original position, not knowing um, how long we, uh, or short a life we were going to have. Um, what he explicitly, so, so I think that's better. Um, but what he explicitly rejects is exactly what people are trying to do in COVID, the piecemeal use of age criteria um, um, in any way to be part, uh, that's not part of an overall prudent allocation of resources over a lifespan. Just sort of deciding well, we're gonna use age criteria for pandemic um, uh, um, surges of need or for earthquakes is not um, part of, the, uh, of Norman Daniels account. And if you think it's your intuition that we ought to save people who are younger rather than people who are older, um, Daniels explicitly rejects um, arguments that are based on intuitions. There is also, and I told you I would return to this, an incredible amount of really sloppy scholarship in this, um, in the medical literature about this. Um, you'll see numerous people quoting and particularly people who are quoting from the Pittsburgh Protocol and copy and pasting it into their own protocols. The quote from John Harris, that be, the difference between it being a tragedy to die young um, and um, uh, um, rather than a misfortune just to die um, as their justification for age-based rationing and life years. Harris explicitly opposes age-based rationing and has for the entirety um, of his career. In fact, he's just so good about describing the uh, opposing position that people take it to be um, his own position. But since he wrote the survival lottery in 1980, up to the present in the um, setting of the COVID pandemic, he wrote an article against age-based rationing called Why Kill the Cabin Boy um, in very colorful language. And he does so as a Benthamite utilitarian, because um, everyone is to count for one and no one for more than one, no matter how old you are. Um, that's his view. Um, and so it's puzzling that people have been allowed to quote Harris as the basis for um, their philosophical justification 
of a life year's approach to rationing when he in fact um, opposes it. Um, puzzling. I think um, uh, the New York State Task Force on Life and the Law um, got it right, got the um, intuition uh, that Harris has correct. When he says proponents argue that it's more appropriate to maximize life years saved rather than the number of lives saved. However, the task force believed that to exclude older adults discriminates against the elder. Um, you're simply saying on the basis of some age cutoff or the number of life years the person is expected to live that they are not eligible for um, a, a ventilator, that not on the basis of their medical condition, but on the basis of age alone, that that is discriminatory. Life years also um, discriminates against the disabled who were very forceful in coming out against these sorts of protocols, many of which um, because of the Office of Civil Rights uh, um, uh, coming after them on, on it, had to actually scale back uh, what they were uh, doing in their uh, protocols because the disabled um, um, on life years criteria um, are often expected uh, to, um, to have shortened lives due to their disabilities and therefore would be discriminated against. Um, moreover, they're often mistakenly taken to have shorter life expectancies based on prejudice and we're very worried about these sorts of um, age-based rationing approaches. So now what's the alternative? Um, I, the one that I think is just, um, uh, is the decisions ought to be made on the basis of need, prognosis, um, and effectiveness. That our principles don't change, how we apply them changes with the circumstances, and in a crisis we need our principles more than ever. And our decisions ought to be guided by the standard duties of beneficence, um, respect for persons, and justice. So here's what I would propose that adhering to these standard principles, um, even in these crisis circumstances would be the way to go. That we would value each person equally regardless of age and disability. And if any of you are involved in the Illinois um, uh, um, plan, planning for, uh, uh, for this, I think the principles will, be, uh, will sound very similar to you that we should decide which treatments are potentially beneficial um, and ordinarily indicated for each patient, just as we would do in any other circumstance. We recognize that the likelihood of effectiveness will vary between patients and that some interventions will not be effective at all um, for some patients. We recognize that morality requires faithful and unbiased efforts in making these clinical judgments, even if our judgments are imperfect. And that rationing limited resources on the basis of the expected effectiveness of treatment um, for each patient would be the proper way to go, which is the way we would typically um, uh, think anyway. What are the alternatives short of rationing? And I think we have a moral obligation to pursue that first. And you know, many of, of you, as we did in DC, I'm sure in Chicago as well, um, were involved in this in the first wave. Um, uh, we're a little in a little better shape right now than you. You may be involved in it again in the second wave here. We do everything reasonable and possible uh, to benefit patients. Um, um, we try to increase the supply, and I think at least the number of ventilators um, has increased. Um, you probably, as we did, were able to increase the number of intensive care units. We use alternatives that are almost as good to temporize. In fact, they turn out to have been better. Patients who just got oxygen the um, happy hypoxics um, did, uh, uh, did better to so use um, alternatives um, to try to temporize, transfer um, if necessary and possible. Um, you probably don't have the benefit of this, but at MedStar, Georgetown MedStar is part of a system. We were actually able to exchange patients across the system when one was pressured more than another, and try to offload the others. Um, uh, Georgetown um, and Washington Hospital Center had better intensivists, so we got more of the sicker patients um, working as a system together. Chances to be creative, you know, I don't know if these worked or not, and there's uh, some controversy about it, but I applaud um, the ingenuity and the 
ethics behind trying to find ways to help people, which is what we as physicians and nurses and other healthcare practitioners ought to be doing in the setting of the crisis, um, doing the best we can for our patients. Um, um, procedurally, though, um, I want to suggest that we do ethics as usual, um, that we discuss patient goals and preferences upon admission, if not sooner, and certainly that's um, um, doing it as outpatients is probably better. We respect the decisions the patients might make to forego intensive care. Uh, we can offer suggestions to patients based on the individual likelihood of benefit. Um, I don't think we should be manipulative. I have real worries about places like Colorado, um, where they're trying to give patients COVID-specific um, uh, um, advanced care planning and saying, well, you're old anyway. Wouldn't you um, want to sign on the dotted line here and say you'd want to give this to a, um, a, to a younger patient? Um, I think if the person spontaneously says that, it's a noble gesture, but I wouldn't want to sort of push them um, into that kind of a view. Um, I am against blanket DNR orders. Um, again, ethics as usual. There should be no carte blanche exclusion of COVID-19 patients solely on the basis of the diagnosis or solely on the basis of age. Um, we should be careful about this. Um, 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 and there may be cases where it's futile and we can argue about that as back in my seven years in uh, uh, at University of Chicago, I often did, particularly with Bill Meadow. But um, uh, nonetheless, um, um, I, you know, I think that DNR orders can sometimes be appropriate, recommended and consented to by the patient. And I think CPR can be biomedically futile um, and it would be business as usual about that as well not simply excluding patients on the basis of age or on the basis of their diagnosis. I think we would have a duty um, if we get to the point where all other alternatives have been exhausted and we need to start rationing intensive care resources to say that we may be having to do rationing, but that it's gonna be done fairly and based on what we always do, need, prognosis, and effectiveness of treatment. What do I mean by need? It's a normal clinical decision. Now, this patient has a medical need for a ventilator, yes or no? It'd be the same standard you would use to ask for a MICU consult for, uh, for a patient. Um, the difference may be um, I um, have um, uh, um, some trepidation, but I think in general, um, having triage teams um, available in hospitals might be the way to do this if you really need to ration. Um, to make sure that it's more than one person. Um, one of them should be an ethicist and one a critical care physician who's not in the intensive care unit at the time, and um, maybe a third person. Um, um, more than one would keep everybody honest, so it's a group decision, um, and it separates the team treating the patients from those excluding the patients, which I think is valuable, and that could help to reduce the moral distress of the clinicians who are actually doing it. Um, uh, taking care of patients, I think it may increase the moral stress to people who are on the triage team, but um, be that it may, at least it divides those two. Um, what do I mean by prognosis, which is what that triage team um, should take into account? If you're going to be in a triage situation, then patients who, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, have a less than six-month life expectancy, I think could be reasonably excluded. Justification would be that they are unlikely to survive to hospital discharge, and there's little chance of even a short-term benefit. Um, so if you've got somebody who's already um, you know, hospice eligible from cancer, they've got um, end-stage dementia, bed-bound, unable to recognize loved ones, not early dementia, but the people who are not gonna live six months from regardless of what you do for them. If those people were to be excluded, it wouldn't be on the basis of life years, but on the basis of really extremely short term um, uh, potential gain. Most people who've been on the, uh, who are in those conditions, even if they do survive, would spend the rest of their um, lives, um, which would probably be very short anyway, um, in, uh, um, in rehab and never, never get out. But largely it should be done then on effectiveness. If you need then, uh, if you've excluded those people who are gonna die within six months anyway, on the basis of effectiveness, um, uh, people who have a need and are not terminally ill, you could use a scoring system to, to help um, 
There's some uh, uh, data that would suggest that Apache is actually, Apache 2 is actually better than SOFA. Um, you could exclude people, for instance, with an Apache 2 score over um, 35. Um, 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 and the rest um, would be um, prioritized so the lowest score gets the um, um, highest priority. If you needed tiebreakers, and again, I think it's complicated enough to try to do any of this if you need to do rationing. Um, I'm puzzled by the people who think, oh, we need to have tiebreakers if people are tied. Um, uh, again, some people have suggested using age for that. I would say no, then it's either first come, first served or a lottery, um, but not age or life years if you need to have a tiebreaker. And I think getting to that point in that heat of battle, of the chaos of actually doing this kind of triage, it would be um, you know, really um, unbelievable that people were thinking about ties and tiebreakers. So, now, what should we do? Um, save the most lives? Um, yes. Save the most life years? No. Um, that's my view at the bottom line. Um, objections that can be raised, you could say our proposal runs against intuitions, um, but intuitions differ, right? Um, um, and in fact, when we began to probe the intuition, it turned out that the intuition was about um, um, the way in which we divide up life, which is not something we can actually divide up as a, uh, as a commodity. And in fact, there are other cultures, um, for instance, Sub-Saharan Africa or Asia, in which the elderly would have priority, a very different um, intuition. Um, so um, I, I'm always skeptical about um, unexamined um, intuitions. You might say, well, age is already baked into effectiveness and prognosis. So I don't think it's based into the prognosis in the way we're talking about a very short term um, um, six month prognosis hospice eligibility. Um, but um, it could be to some extent baked into effectiveness, um, but that's probably um, you know, reasonable um, to think about age, for instance, as one criterion in a scoring system about how people are going to fare if they're put um, on a ventilator, it's probably there standing in for things like stem cell reserves, uh, immune capacity, et cetera, that we can't, uh, can't actually measure, rather than valuing the number of years the person will live, per se. Um, how do we justify looking at short-term but not long-term prognosis? Maybe your objection, again, I'm talking about very short-term prognosis, which is really a sort of slight extension um, of what it means to be effective uh, rather than valuing age um, uh, and years of life per se. Um, and those who say that we're in unprecedented times, that we need unprecedented measures, I say no, um, that we need to stick to our principles and apply them um, in these particular um, circumstances. Um, we ought not abandon our ethical principles even in these circumstances. We ought not to discriminate against the disabled and the elderly, and our decisions ought to continue to be made on the basis of need, prognosis, and effectiveness, guided as best we can by standard duties of beneficence, respect for persons, and justice. Um, and with that, I'll conclude by thanking um, my uh, co-investigators on both the theoretical and the empirical uh, project, uh, Bernard Krusak, a philosopher at King's College, um, Mary-Kate uh, Garkey, one of my PhD students, uh, Tony Jung, um, a fourth year medical student here at Georgetown, um, and uh, Emily uh, Shear, uh, who's a, uh, an MD, MBE candidate at Penn, um, who decided that she'd um, rather uh, work with us than with Zeke Emanuel on this issue. So with uh, that, um, I uh, think I have some time um, for, uh, for questions. Thank you. Great. Um, again, I just want to thank you on, on behalf of the uh, organizers of the ethics series, Dr. Solmezi, for, for this talk that, that continues to sort of contribute to our discussion about resource allocation. Um, and just to note that, that two of the, uh, the names you mentioned, uh, George Anas and, and Doug White, will, will be part of the lecture series later on in this quarter. So um, we look forward to hearing what they have to say uh, uh, in sort of response to what you said as well. So there are a number of questions in the chat and in the Q&A, and I just want to remind people to, to please try to put your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat. Um, but I'll get started with 
two sort of comments and questions that are, are, are similarly aligned from, from Monica Peak and Will Parker. And uh, Monica notes that we can estimate a normal lifespan based on the average lifespan in an area, say the US or Illinois. We can divide res resources in a way that supports those populations whose life expectancy is shorter than the average because of social inequities such as structural racism. So that's sort of sort of Monica's comment. And then I think Will Parker kind of follows up on that um, by asking the question, can you address the racial justification of prioritizing younger, younger patients? And he goes on to state that white people have longer age expectancy in the US because of racism. COVID mortality amongst young black people is dramatically higher than white people. Younger people of color are much more likely to get COVID than young white people because of structural racism. A Harvard working paper estimates that the US Latinx population has lost 48,204 years and black populations have lost 45,770 years compared to only 33,446 uh, for white people. So thus ignoring age would likely lead to triage protocols that would exacerbate existing racial disparities in health and life expectancy. So a lot to, for you to sort of un, un, unpack there. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I think that um, you run into problems trying to use you know, age as a proxy for, um, for racial disparities, right? Um, and that's sort of what you're, you know, what you're trying to do here. Um, um, in, in the kinds of comments that, you, that, you're, uh, that you're making. What we ought to be able um, to do um, um, is to, uh, and, and secondly, um, it seems to me that um, addressing um, racial inequalities you know, retrospectively um, by rationing at the bedside um, is, is a wrong-headed way to do it. Um, there are clearly um, racial disparities that lead um, people to be um, uh, um, at higher risk for this, and we should not, um, in fact, um, 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 exclude um, uh, uh, people, um, um, obviously, on the basis um, of, of race. Um, we may have a moral obligation to reach out uh, to make sure that people who are um, in um, um, minority groups that are disproportionately affected by this um, get the resources uh, that they need. But once they come to the emergency room and once they're in the hospital, um, the life expectancy of the, the survivability of a black person versus a white person, and this has been studied, is exactly equal. And I'm talking about what happens when they're actually um, um, in, the, um, in the hospital. I can't make up for, um, in the hospital, um, those background um, uh, racial inequalities. And somehow, sometimes people get some of this, they get so convoluted about this, and we went through this in the District of Columbia, um, that they're trying to sort of um, correct for um, racial injustices in the society um, that pre-exist and um, shamefully make people um, more um, uh, uh, um, predisposed to um, high mortality um, by saying um, that um, we should, uh, for instance, um, ration vaccines um, so that we give them um, to uh, people who are in first line um, jobs uh, where there are more um, minorities in things like bus drivers um, and um, uh, an emergency uh, uh, kinds of, or, or other kinds of front line workers other than healthcare workers. Um, rather than giving them to people who are over 65. Um, that winds up in the end actually exacerbating um, some of the racial inequalities um, because older black lives matter too, right? Um, and Kaiser was very good about pointing this out in a, um, in a, um, uh, in a paper that was done back in March. The, the mortality rate um, um, for um, uh, from COVID in the age 65 to 74 range for African Americans, for black people is five times that of white people. Um, 
So we shouldn't be saying, as the ACIP said, that, well, we give vaccine in order to, um, to engineer um, retrospectively, uh, make up for racial injustices um, to people who are in jobs that are frontline, like um, postal workers or, um, uh, or, uh, or bus drivers, um, uh, because there are more minorities there, we should give it to them um, and not give it to people who are over 65, you wind up actually exacerbating mortality in precisely the group that you're trying to, uh, uh, to help. So I appreciate that there are deep um, injustices in our society, um, but I think that trying to use age um, as a proxy to try to retrospectively make up for that um, is, the wrong, is just the wrong way to go. Um, we need, in fact, to address those, um, uh, those disparities, but not doing it through this um, convoluted way, which might wind up doing more harm than good. Is, is, is that your intuition that it exacerbates, um, you know, like older Black Lives Matter, uh, or, or is, that, is, there, is that proven by data? The, the, the mortality for um, African Americans between the ages of 65 and 74 is five times that of similar um, situated white people. Um, so those are those are people we need to come, need to help. Those are people we need to help. Those are data from the CDC. And that's not just an intuition. That's data. Okay. And and hopefully that answer suffices to answer those questions. Along a sort of similar line, um, another question comes up that pointing to the duty of justice and how COVID has exposed entrenched medical and health disparities, how would you respond to a question of access to resources, especially vis-a-vis -vis your formulation of need prognosis and effectiveness? Yeah, I, th I think that that's a better way to go at this, right? Um, if there are injustices, um, you know, um, that we can make up for as a healthcare system there in, in the realm of access, right? Um, um, and uh, making sure uh, that we have, um, you know, sufficient amounts of vaccine that go to um, a hospital. For instance, what we did in the District of Columbia in, in uh, distributing vaccine was we did it by caseload um, uh, among the hospitals. Howard had, uh, University Hospital had more cases of COVID they got more vaccine, right? That's putting access to where the need is, and the need um, is differentiated by the um, uh, um, um, by the conditions of the local uh, local community. So um, anything we can do um, to improve access, if that means you know giving more um, ambulance services to uh, differentially impacted communities, so that those persons get equal access to the resources that we can give them, those are things we can do in the way of, of justice. But once people are in the hospital, we sort of decide um, that we're going to um, you know, ration on the basis of um, age, race, anything else, I think just goes against um, our, um, um, uh, our instincts as, as clinicians. That's great. And I just want to sort of point out to all the participants and sort of let you remind you that sort of this quarter, we're really going to be focusing on, on health disparities in, in, in subsequent lectures. Um, so we'll tackle this subject um, uh, through that mechanism as, as well. Um, moving on to sort of just sort of thinking about the sort of the value of life. There are a few questions that, that sort of raise this point. So all these arguments appear to value life only in an egocentric way i.e. the value of one's life only to oneself. How do you take account of the value of a life to others? No, that's a, a terrific question. Um, and, and certainly um, the one you know, hope we may have for, for what COVID vaccine might teach our society um, is a better sense of um, responsibility for others, right? You know, we, we all know, despite the messaging that we Get, which might be tailored to try to get more people to wear masks, that the main reason for wearing a mask in public is to prevent other people from getting sick, not to protect you, right? It is other-centered. Um, uh, the main reason um, that I often have success in, uh, in uh, our resident clinic in convincing um, patients to get vaccinated against the flu, <laughs> um, it, when they've initially told the resident no, um, I go back into the room and say, 
Well, you know, um, uh, do you have grandkids? Are you in a church choir? <laughs> right? This isn't about you. This is about all of us, right? Um, um, and the sort of sense in which we can, in fact, work collectively um, um, to help the, um, the, the community um, is the instinct that we, um, the moral instinct that we ought to cultivate as best we can. Um, in terms of somebody who comes into the hospital um, and says, says to me, you know, I'm 80 years old, I've lived a good life, let somebody else who's younger get the ventilator, I'm not going to object to that, right? What I object to is forcing that person to not get it rather than allowing them to be communitarian and other other centered in their own uh, in their own thinking. So the more we can, um, in fact, cultivate that in the setting of the pandemic, uh, the better. So so to, to think about to to scale up that, that that scenario where there's an 80 year old who comes in and says you know declines it to say give it to somebody younger. If you scale that up to think about public support and thinking about you know not just thinking about yourself but thinking about others. What if there was public support, partly based on just sort of the intuition that we should be giving these th resources to younger younger people um, so they have have more life? What would your response to that be? Well, you know, it's like anything else in a you know in a democracy. You don't want a tyranny of the majority, right? <laughs> so because most people are less than eighty, you could sort of say, you know, let grandma go, right? <laughs> and, um, and so so you want to balance out a sense of um, you know. A communitarian spirit on people's part, um, um, but you don't want to force it on people without absolute necessity. Um, um, and in fact, um, uh, I think that sort of saying that, you know, all it's part of the problem with these focus groups. If there's nobody over 80 in them, people will say, sure, we should give it to people who are less than 80, uh, right? Um, um, but we want to make sure that we um, maybe even a, in, a, in a sense have um, um, a you know, um, a, well, we have a sense, it, it's always a problem, isn't it? Um, and it's, it's a part of the larger part of this is the clash between public health ethics um, and clinical ethics, right? Um, it's the same when we're being told now, you know, continually to practice population medicine uh, when we're practicing on individual patients, right? Um, and, you know, we can set um, 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 rules um, as a community within which we can then have parameters to, to work with. But we want to make sure that those rules are as fair as they can be um, um, to everybody while guarding the collective whole. And the value, you know, of caring for elderly people is one we shouldn't, um, you know, dismiss um, too, uh, too readily. Lots of other, we can learn from a lot of other societies about their respect for the elderly compared to um, our youth glorifying culture. Um, we did look along the sort of similar lines. Um, uh, the question is asked, but but don't some of your sort of prognosis considerations have to do with quality of life, which then discriminates against those whose whose lives many of us wouldn't want? Yeah, that's a you know that's a you know, potentially a good, uh, good objection. It's trying to balance out, you know, sort of, you know, being practical about this, sort of how far will you, you know, will you go in terms of, you know, making, you know, if, if people wanted to jettison that completely, um, the prognosis part, um, I'm, you know, I'm not sure I'd object completely because so much of that would be tied up into the effectiveness um, category anyway, um, particularly in Apache scores, comorbid conditions become um, a predictor as they should of whether the person will um, survive to, to discharge or not. I just think it's uh, it could be a lot cleaner to actually um, um, uh, uh, come to a decision that if people have a less than six month um, um, survival, um, um, that they might be um, um, the, the one exclusion criteria and I I would be able to tolerate that I think was not in that sense valuing life years as a value. Um, it was just being practical um, in this very limited sense about um, what benefit we could expect to give such a person, which I think would be extremely, um, uh, extremely limited, um, if at all, if at all. So if you want to jettison it, if you were to push me, 
jettison that and make it all just effectiveness, it could be rolled into effectiveness. But I think as a practical matter, it might be a, a simpler cutoff. Hopefully we don't have to do any of this, right? That's uh, hopefully we don't. And I don't know what the situation on the ground is at, um, uh, in, in Chicago. It's not been as bad here in the hospital as it was in April in the hospital in terms of, uh, in terms of numbers and needing to increase to four and five intensive care units. Yeah, our, our numbers here aren't, aren't as high as they were during the, the spring surge as well. Um, uh, moving on to a, a few other questions. So would automatic DNRs be ethically justifiable in the context of scarcity for patients excluded from a needed ventilator if the patient was triaged and then placed on a DNR based on survivability instead of life years or specific diagnosis? Yeah, that's again, my view about um, um, uh, DNR orders is that they should be on the basis of, fu of futility. Right, um, and I define futility. This will go back to discussions that many of us had <laughs> quite a few times in uh, um, in uh, in you know case case conference um, um, uh, over the years. Um, that if to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, CPR either will not work uh, or would be repeatedly um, 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 necessary or with the patient dying in a very short period of time, even if it were provided. That's a point at which I could say uh, that it would be um, futile and therefore um, unilaterally um, instituted. Um, but short of that, um, I think the, the one thing I didn't say, by the, uh, by the way, it was a slide I had in another talk and left out is, um, um, and uh, importantly, and I'm thinking of it now, is that if someone is triaged out, um, got to be incredibly sure uh, that that doesn't mean we're not caring for them and not providing um, the maximum kind of palliative care that we can for such persons. Um, and, and certainly the people who are in um, uh, an intensive care unit should be getting maximum palliative care as well. Uh, we need to treat patient symptoms under these conditions. You know, obviously many of you have seen, particularly Brian, if you're you know, working as a hospitalist, you were probably revved up to be the be, be a, an intensivist or an ER doc, and you know the, the sort of um, horror of the, the people who do go south and, and die from this and die in isolation, um, and the and the real need to be um, as um, as compassionate um, and uh, human toward them in terms of palliating their symptoms as we possibly can, you know, super ethical priority, particularly. Um, for persons who, who, in the event that they are triaged out of intensive care, but not neglecting the palliative care needs of other persons as well. And, and thinking about sort of making decisions at, at the bedside, uh, a question came up that, that stated, I don't think tiebreakers are avoidable. SOFA scores are the practical ones to calculate in real time and are often similar early in COVID. If you don't have an objective tiebreaker, aren't you just relying on the subjective and potentially biased judgment of bedside physicians? Um, you, you could, um, well, it's maybe another reason why, actually if, um, uh, there's at least one study I've seen, it was my intuition um, initially that Apache scores would be better uh, prognosticators in um, uh, in COVID, and there's in fact been at least one study in JAMA that's shown that to be true. You know? um, and um, you now with electronic medical records, you know, they're fairly easy to calculate pretty uh, pretty quickly. So I don't know that they are as difficult to do. And and I wasn't saying that you didn't need, um, you might not need a tiebreaker. Um, I think you'd need less of it if you've got Apache than if you have SOFA scores. Um, but if you do need a tiebreaker, um, uh, then I think, you know, lottery or first come first serve is what I suggested and not age. Um, um, and, um, um, but again, you know, I, I think there's a lot of sort of, you know, over, over planning of, um, of this. I mean, it's good to try to avoid prejudices and biased decisions at the bedside. Um, but I think a lot of this we're going to have to rely on the, you know, uh, the reason and goodwill of, of clinicians to do the best they can in what will inevitably be an incredibly chaotic situation, which is, un I think, underappreciated by a lot of the people who are going through the sort of uh, 
third level tiebreaker <laughs> kinds of kinds of scenarios um, um, if this has to be you know, has to be done. So if there are tiebreakers, um, yes, just not age. Okay. Um, another question: uh, What about auctioning off some valuable resources to raise cash for R and D or to help even more patients? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, um, I um, you know, know that there would be, um, you know, quite a, you know, quite a market for that. Um, I can say that um, there have been a lot of people who've said over the, you know, over the years um, that, um, you know, the NIH budget, for instance, is a moral act, right? Um, deciding how much money we're going to give first to the NIH for research, and then what kinds of diseases we will research. Um, are really moral decisions. Um, um, and um, uh, there is reason to sort of think more clearly about you know, whether we're doing enough for common diseases, whether we're doing enough for emerging pathogens, you know, whether um, we overemphasize certain diseases that become you know, sexy or they're scientifically interesting rather than um, um, you know, significant for um, the populations that um, are um, paying the taxes that go into the, uh, the research as well. Um, you know, on the other hand, um, you don't want to stifle um, you know, um, scientific research and, and allow that to be as free as possible because most of the time, Dr. Serendipity is the one who comes up with the most important discovery that will you know, save, the most, save the most lives. So I wouldn't stifle all you know, creativity, but I think being the thrust of the question, should we be more um, considerate about how we spend our resources on um, research for things that really matter. Yes, um, and maybe we will have learned that studying emergent diseases, um, you know, um, deserves more um, uh, more funding than it's had in the past. I suspect we will learn that. But but look at how um, you know, isn't it amazing um, um, that we have a number of vaccines already? Right? And what made that possible, you know, but very basic research on messenger RNA, um, the fact that there were already people working on coronaviruses, that, that this um, disease um, could be, the cause could be discovered and the genome sequenced within months, the vaccines would be available within a year of the emergence of the vaccine. I mean, all of that, I mean, the emergence of the pandemic, you know, all of that is based on, um, you know, some pretty basic scientific research that um, people were poised to, to put into use. So we can't make, you know, the, uh, uh, we can't make everything so practical that we're not allowing you know, some of this basic research to go on that will allow, um, uh, you know, responses um, in real time um, that will be creative to very significant problems. Um, so you know, I'm I'm very grateful. Um, many of you, I presume, have already you know gotten your first shot of this vaccine, and that's um, you know it's remarkable. Remarkable. Certainly. Um, although there is a comment that says there had there have been cases of of sort of charity auctions in vaccines, uh, though the black market dwarfs the auction market in size, sadly. Um, and I, I think that there's some of that that has emerged in sort of the, the mainstream media. Yeah, about. yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there is you know for vaccines, right? Um, uh, I got some questions from a reporter actually from the Hill, <laughs> um, the publication about this. Um, do hospitals have a responsibility to safeguard their vaccines? Um, um, because it is a black market uh, commodity, and there and there are um, serious worries about um, vaccines being diverted by um, um, by organized crime, for instance. Um, and um, and we had an unfortunate incident um, of somebody who, for reasons that are still not um, clear, um, destroyed 500 doses of vaccine. So, um, so I do think we do have a moral responsibility to be careful about safeguarding our um, vaccine from the, from the black market. I, I just, before we sort of get close to wrapping up, from a philosophical perspective, whether you're talking about lives or sort of life years, is there a basic assumption of what happens during that time in terms of a life lived or, or the life years? From a sort of philosophical perspective, like what do we do with that time that we, that we save? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, 
think people, um, and it's the gift of human freedom that you know, you, you know that, that you do with the life what um, you know uh, what what you choose to. We hope that you are well brought up um, and use your time um, effectively, virtuously, live a virtuous life. Um, but again, we can't guarantee that, um, um, and it's our obligation as physicians. Um, not to decide that one person's life is going to be spent more worthily than another and decide, therefore, not to give them um, health care resources. Our obligation um, is to respect them as individuals um, who are embodied, um, who are, you know, um, um, who are in, in many cases, but not all, free um, to make choices of that, uh, of, of how they live their lives. And even those who can't, right, think of the you know, think of the uh, the person who um, um, is um, is mentally retarded. Um, again, I don't want to make judgments that because um, they might not um, be as free in their choices, or they might not be as um, uh, creative in their choices, that um, um, I don't have an obligation um, out of respect for them as human beings and as nothing else regardless of their intellectual capabilities, regardless of their disabilities, regardless of their age, regardless of their race, regardless of their creed, to help them because they are human and they have come to me for help and I'm a doctor who has vowed that I will, uh, I will put my um, uh, um, resources and uh, abilities um, uh, to their benefit. Actually, a late, a late inning question popped into the, into the Q&A. Should those involved in a, a late inning? <laughs> yeah, so should those involved in the vaccine black market be ineligible for vaccines? Uh, I'll, that's a forensic, uh, a forensic question. I'll leave that to uh, district attorneys and legislators. <laughs> I think that that looks to be all the questions in the chat or the Q and A. Uh, Laney and Mark, I'll I'll turn it over to you for any last questions and and Mark for closing. I, I had written a question, uh, uh, but but somehow it didn't appear, and, and that that was that, that that in the 1918 flu epidemic, that killed somewhere between 50 million and 150 million people in the world, it it appeared that 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 the people who were at greatest risk were were younger and middle-aged people rather than the elderly, whereas in, in this pandemic, the COVID-19 one, it, everything seems to point to the elderly being at so much higher risk than the younger people or the middle-aged people. Um, does that in any way influence your determination as to who should be, who, who, who might be uh, treated more aggressively in the hospital or for that, for that matter, vaccinated uh, earlier? Uh, yeah, I, um, good, good question. I think you're, um, uh, you're right. Um, the, um, my last look at CDC statistics are that approximately 90% of the persons who have died in the United States of COVID-19 have either been over 65 years of age or if they were younger, had at least two comorbid conditions associated with the disease. So it's so if you're younger than 65, um, uh, you only um, seem to be at high risk of severe um, morbidity and death if you, let's say, got diabetes and COPD or something. Um, so so yes, it differentially affects um, um, the uh, those who are uh, those who are uh, um, sickest. But basically, I think. Um, the, the, the view I would say is that, um, you know, we, we treat the sick. <laughs> and if the sick who come to us are five years old, that's who we treat. Um, and if they're 75 years old, that's, uh, that's who we treat. Um, and if um, they, um, you know, if, if in this case, um, the, the, the five-year-old can be treated at home and the 75-year-old needs the hospital, that's the way we go. Um, if it was nine, if it was a 1918 flu and it was inverted, then we could treat the 75-year-old at home, um, and the five-year-old needed the intensive care unit. That's who gets it, right? I mean, it's just um, I think a matter of need, prognosis, and effectiveness. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, Lainey, it, it, no. Uh, no. I, I just want to offer my deepest thanks to Dan Somezi. Fabulous for, talk. For a fabulous talk. And um, uh, I'm actually looking forward to reviewing it again uh, on the video because the talk and the slides were, were, were so, um, uh, so critically important. Uh, Dan, we miss you at the university and we love having you visit us even if it's by Zoom this time. And, and I hope it'll be in person next time. But thank you so much. Thank you. I miss, uh, miss all of you. I'm uh, be uh, looking forward to the day I can come back uh, physically. <laughs> That'll be great. Thanks. All right. All right. Thank Ciao. you so much, Dan.